is our automation workshop. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on a up-and-coming Python package that uh, is geared towards helping manage connectivity to network devices and sending, uh, sending commands, getting output, uh, and basically all the network automation things, the hard stuff. Uh, this is uh, not a this is not a framework, right? This isn't like Ansible. This isn't like nor near. There's no like inventory management. There's no you know kind of a dedicated place for variables and, and all these other things that you would typically find in an automation framework. This is really just a package to help. Uh, manage connections to devices and get up and uh, get up and running with them. If I had to draw any parallels between Scraply, which is the project we're going to be looking at, and uh, other solutions out there in the wild, instead of comparing it to something like Ansible, I would say it's more in line with things like NetMiko, uh, if you've used that in the past. Uh, it's it's again it's a package just like Namiko is, and its focus is to just manage connections, do network automation y stuff, and kind of back out. Now, what what interested me in this package is that I'm starting to see it used more and more in different automation solutions, uh, and some of the reasons why I started to. I started to uncover as I was trying to peel back the onion as to kind of what makes this thing tick. One of the things that I saw that was really interesting is that the, the developer, his name is Carl, uh, one of the things that he did is he, he completely wrote all like the drivers and the connectivity uh, channels and, and all the transport. He wrote it all himself from scratch. Uh, and because of that, he got rid of a lot of kind of the bloat and you know kind of dependency bloat that you see in other projects. Like if you install Ansible, for instance, you don't just install Ansible. Ansible has uh, dozens of dependencies. And so you'll end up with like a really, really, really huge amount of things that get installed. And uh, yeah, there, there's strengths and weaknesses, but getting back to Scrapply, Carl writing this, you know, completely from the ground up, he like focused on making it simple to use, to build automation with, but also extremely performant, very, very fast. And so, uh, let's let's go ahead and just begin our little discussion here. I think I've got I've got things that I need to close, like email, like Slack, like the things that can get you in trouble when you're sharing your screen. Uh, and this is the wrong deck as well. Let me see if I. I honestly, I, I don't think I have very much to. Yeah, here we go. Uh, again, I think it's just literally just two slides, uh, this being one of them. Uh, this is going to be the topic for today, a uh, package called Scraply. Um, the way that I wanted to frame this is I wanted to like, combine this with another initiative that we have here at Juniper. And that initiative is a, think of it as like a, a security focused developer GitHub a uh, place where a code exchange where you, the customer, or um, you, the Juniper employee, or you, the Juniper partner, uh, can actually contribute your own automation and get it promoted and uh, up through our, uh, our NGNet. And so we call this code exchange. Uh, this is very similar to what you would see like in DevNet, right? This is the we, we've tried to get these things off the ground and running up before. Uh, so you may have seen similar ideas to this. Uh, and so what I wanted to do today on this call, is I wanted to contribute to the code exchange with whatever it is that we come up with today. Uh, and I, I'm gonna focus on security just because I, I really, really enjoy um, doing network automation with security stuff. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll learn how Scraply operates at a high level. And then we'll build a new project in GitHub. I'll show you, uh, we, we kind of revisited it. We kind of visited this a couple years ago or a couple of months ago when we did the, like your first Python program uh, where we you know did things like create a GitHub account and create a repository and then find out how to manage Python dependencies, those types of things. 
Well, we're going to be revisiting it here because we're just going to build a project and then we're going to submit our code at the end of today's workshop to this code exchange. Uh, and hopefully, if we do a good job and a good job of documentation and a good job with our code, it will get blessed by those that have the uh, approval and we will see our code here uh, hosted in the code exchange. Now, unfortunately for you, I'm going to get all the credit for it because I'm going to be the one submitting it. Uh, but if you'd like at any time uh, to visit this, to see some of the automation that we have in the different domains, if you'd like to contribute, if you want to uh, fork it, make it some improvements, re-contribute it back, uh, that's, that's all up for you. Um, so that's kind of going to be the context for today. It's going to be a, a pretty loose conversation. I don't have a lot of experience with this product called Scrapply because it's, it's very, very new. And honestly, I'll, most of my attention is like, uh, for better or for worse, is with Ansible day in, day out, because that's, that's what people like to see. So we're going to build a new security project, uh, uh, yeah, a new security focused project. Uh, we're going to be basing it in Python on learning the Scrapply application. Uh, we're going to create a project on GitHub. Again, we'll go through all the processes, checking out the checking out the repository, adding our code, adding comments, merge requests, those types of things that you would do with a GitHub project. Uh, and uh, we'll also revisit setting up a Python virtual environment, which is incredibly critical. If you've missed past sessions on why that's so important, we'll definitely be touching upon it here. And then finally, we'll make the decision on whether or not we want to dockerize or technically containerize our application. I'm a very big fan of doing containerization. I think it's the absolute way to go as far as uh, automation goes, but um, it's not the it's not really required for every environment. I just really like the portability of Docker containers that lets me kind of move around. Uh, so getting started, let's first, uh, we'll, let's give a really high level overview of what Scrapply is. Uh, we, we talked about it uh, just at the beginning. Uh, again, what Scrapply is, is a, a Python package that helps you manage connections to remote devices, send commands or send config, um, and get data back from the network device. Very, very much similar to for NetMiko, uh, just without any kind of the dependencies bloat uh, that gets thrown into there. Uh, and because of those extremely lightweight nature, if we actually, if we look at the, uh, the project on GitHub, uh, we can see uh, that uh, it, it's, it's got about uh, 30 releases to date. Uh, but it's used by uh, 86 other projects right now. Uh, and so that tells you that, hey, this thing has weight. Right? There, there's, there's definitely some, some value within here. And I'm hoping, hoping today that we can just kind of revisit it. It's got a really cute logo too, by the way. Really love that. Uh, it, if you don't get the joke, um, we talked about this in one of our past sessions, Python, the name of the programming language Python comes from Monty Python's uh, Quest for the Holy Grail. And because of that, uh, some of the things, some of the Python packages you'll see out there, out there will be a reference to that Monty Python type of uh, uh, world, if you will. In this case, um, there's a there's a joke towards the end of Monty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail that involves the rabbit. Um, that's that's the idea behind the logo that we've got here. Uh, and so let's do this. Let's let's actually just hang out within our our the documentation uh, for this. Um, it's uh, before we start going off and asking questions uh, or whenever you're discovering like a new Python package, please. Always check the documentation first. Uh, I honestly, I don't follow this rule myself. And actually, I did not follow this rule with Scrapply. Uh, I just messaged Carl some basic questions. Uh, but the documentation, from what I've seen, is outstanding in comparison to other Python packages. It's short, it's concise, it's to the point. Uh, and that's what I really appreciate. Thorough documentation is. Um, it's unfortunately it's lacking in the automation space and that can make things extremely frustrating when you're trying to learn and get off the ground and running. Um, so I mentioned that Scrapply will uh, handle the, like the network connections to the devices. Uh, the, the name itself, Scrapply, 
is like they're saying here is a combination of the phrase scrape CLI. And that is one of the things that Scrappily will do with you, uh, with your network devices. If they do not have an API, and all the Juniper devices do, but if you, you are working in a multi-vendor environment, you do have to worry about uh, automating non-API driven solutions. And so this is a good alternative for something like that. It will manage the uh, the command or the connection and then send the, uh, the commands. And then it's up to you, the user to scrape the CLI output, either using text parsers like text FSM or, uh, or just regex patterns, uh, whatever it is that you need to do to get the job done. Um, honestly, if the product stopped with that, we would not be having this conversation today because I, I personally don't see a lot of value in learning or mastering rather a scraping of CLI commands. I think it's, it's a terrible way of doing automation. It's a complete waste of your time and it's error prone and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what's great about Scrapply is that there's also a uh, additional Scrapply functionality. And one of those is the netconf. Um, so the, the, the transports for the devices are still running over SSH, but there, there is a netconf version of Scrapply that will allow us to interact with the APIs on our devices. And since in today's lab environment, we're going to be working with Juniper firewalls because we're going to do some security stuff, we're definitely going to take advantage of that. So we won't be doing any screen scraping, so not the, uh, the native uh, version of Scrapply. We'll be using the Scrapply netconf. There are other aspects of Scrapply, though. Uh, Scrapply is being inserted into other automation frameworks like Nornir uh, to actually help, again, manage the connections to the devices just because it's so incredibly fast and, and, and really screams for performance. We'll talk about what kind of separates it as far as performance goes here just in a second. Uh, there's also some other uh, iterations to where uh, Scrapply is being inserted. So there's there's other really great scra uh, Scrapply projects out there. But again, for us, our focus, we're going to be spending here with the, the NetComp side of things. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, Scrapply is going to uh, build a connection to the devices over the NetConf um, API. And it's going to handle uh, the remote procedural calls or the RPCs, which are basically our show commands that we would do on a device. It's just the it's the show command ported or mapped out to a netconf API call or rest or remote procedural call. Uh, and so Scrapply netconf will handle that for us. Uh, get the output from there. The output will be in XML because netconf is natively XML. So we'll have to figure out in our script how to deal with that. Um, XML is not always the friendliest of, of data formats to work with, but you can whip it into shape, uh, shape fairly quickly with some of the projects out there. So we'll be looking at that. Now, I, I talked about its performance and that it's significantly, it has some significant advantages over some of the others out there. Uh, now, I have to warn you, uh, my background is not software development. I did not go to school for this. I, I did not, uh, not a computer science major or anything along those lines. Uh, so I, I feel sometimes when I talk about certain things, I'm a little bit above, I'm speaking a little bit above my knowledge base. And this is one of the parts that I will fully admit to. Uh, Okay, so it, it happens to deal with this concept of synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, we've talked in the past about Python, like most scripting languages out there, is a synchronous uh, scripting language. And, and what I mean by that essentially is that when you're going through a Python script, if you are executing some type of function and you're waiting for a response, the entire script will wait and it'll wait and it'll wait and it'll wait. And this affects us in the networking world when we're doing automation against more than one device, right? Is that the, the script will wait for the first device to complete and then go do the second device and then go to the third. And so that kind of cascading uh, effect over time really extends you know, the execution time required to get the script uh, off, the, off the ground and running. 
Now, some of the solutions that we've looked in the past, like around the automation frameworks like Ansible, they have a, a, a method of, well, getting around is not the right way of saying it, but they have a way of handling um, multiple connections at the same time while keeping the output received from each device uh, in its safe little space, right? Um, so there's the output from one device will never get you know mistaken for output in the other. And the way that they do that is this method of what we call threads. Now, I'm not the smartest person in this space, right? But threads is effectively how all the other network automation solutions not named Scrapply uh, is taking care of this kind of asynchronous like uh, or multi-connection type of functionality. Um, there's, there's apparently some challenges with doing threads in that you're still pinned to a single CPU uh, and that the, the script itself isn't, still, isn't really operating in a non-blocking fashion. Uh, and so what makes Scrapply so different is that it doesn't use threads like Ansible, like Nornir, like some of the other solutions we've looked at. It instead uses another package from Python called async IO. Uh, and if none of this makes sense, don't worry. It, this, is, this part is more on the technical side, just for those that are curious as to why Scrapply is being revered as so much more performant than the others. Uh, async IO, as it's been explained to me, is a true like non-blocking manner of executing certain functions, asynchronous functions, um, in parallel at the same time. And so what we'll do today is we'll show both like a traditional synchronous, which I think will be a lot easier to understand. And then we'll look at uh, trying to take our script and make it into an asynchronous fashion. So we we can execute against multiple devices and not, not be sitting there waiting for one to complete uh, before we execute on the other. Um, so that was a long-winded way of saying, uh, Scrapply is doing a couple things a little bit different. And because of that, there are some pretty significant performance uh, enhancements with it. <laughs> All right, uh, looking into the docs, um, and I'm, I'm using these docs as my presentation because one, I didn't really have enough time and two, this documentation is excellent. And three, like I said, you should always start with docs. Um, the installation is extremely simple. Uh, pip installed scrappily netconf. Uh, and I believe there's only one dependency in there, which I think is LXML, which is a library to help Python work with XML. Again, the responses from our devices will be in XML will want to be able to work with that. And that's where the LXML package dependency will come in here. Uh, so installing it is very, very similar to our traditional Python package installation process. We're gonna be using pip uh, for that. In my case, I'm technically gonna be using poetry, but don't, don't sweat the details. And it looks like you know a, a simple example. It should be pretty uh, easy to just kind of do the play-by-play -play here. On the first line of this example here, we are importing the netconf driver from Scrapply into our script, right? First objective is to install Scrapply. The next objective is then within our script to import some of the functionality so that we can have success with our, our goals here. So we're importing a uh, the, the netconf driver. Uh, and it's just worth mentioning the driver uh, is going to be what we interface with within the script, right? So the driver is where we're going to pass the driver some information, some parameters, and then the driver is going to go and interact with the actual transport to, to make the connections and do the things, right? So when you're using Scrapply, you're going to be playing primarily with the, the driver in, in, the, in the communications to the network device. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. We're importing the netconf driver from the netconf driver dot driver uh, module that was uh, installed right here. And then we're creating a dictionary in Python, right? This will be all in Python, by the way. There will not be any YAML in here, uh, any JSON. It's just going to be Python and XML. For many organizations, that's 
perfect. That's exactly what they want. They want to kind of cut out any of the fluff and just doing things natively in Python is easier for them. In this case, we're going to create a dictionary in Python and we're going to pass in some of the parameters that are related to the device that we're going to automate. In this case, we pass a host, uh, which is an IP form. Uh, like I'm imagining that could also be a host name. I haven't seen an example to, to say so, but we'll be testing that out. Uh, looks like we pass in authentication username, authentication password, uh, authentication strict key, and that one is not a string. It looks like it's set to a Boolean. Um, I'm imagining that's the uh, initial, whenever you build an initial connection to SSH, there's a, a check on your system to make sure that the public key on the remote side is, um, is within your known host. And so we're going to disable that so that the Python script doesn't get tripped up. And we can specify the port. In this case, we're going to, looks like we're going to fall back onto the default port, which is 830. Um, Quick trivia question, uh, what kind of object is that? Is that a string, integer, float, dictionary, list? I will keep my eyeballs on the chat to see if anyone comes back with that on the port. Uh, so we, we've created that object called my device. It's got all the connection parameters. And then we're going to use the netconf driver that we imported, and we're gonna pass in our dictionary that defines our device right here. And that's all that's required to define the connection parameters. The next thing that we do is we use this open method uh, that will actually, uh, that will be ran against the connection object that we just created there. So within the netconf driver, this is a, a class of object. We're passing in our parameter. And within this netconf driver, there's a function inside of there called open. And that's going to uh, effectively build the, uh, the session to the device based on all the parameters that we passed up here. At this point, we are going to have a, an active SSH session, um, in this case, over port 830 uh, to the device. And here we're going to be running another method on the connection object. In this case, it's called git config. And we are passing in a parameter. And we say the source that we're really interested in knowing is the running config. And if you're coming from like a Cisco background, the running config uh, makes a lot of sense for you. And the Juniper world, that's basically just what's, um, uh, what's committed on the box right now. Uh, you could have gone for the candidate configuration. So any candidate or any configuration changes that have been staged, but not actually committed, you could have changed that to be candidate for that. Uh, and here we just print the result. Now in this example, it looks like they're doing this against a Cisco device. Uh, they're getting some RPC data that's coming back here, uh, port 830. Yeah, this looks like an iOS XR device based on that interface naming nomenclature that keeps me awake at night. Um, so very, very cool, uh, <laughs> quite simple, right? Uh, literally just define the connection parameters, open the connection, uh, make your request, and then print the result to the screen. Now a good network engineer uh, would also close this connection because you don't want your uh, SSH sessions to persist. And unless you explicitly tell it to, uh, to close, it will maintain that connection until um, something interrupts the session. Uh, so with all of that said, let's look at some basic operations using Junos. And here is a, an example from the GitHub repository. Doesn't look like it's much different. Right, uh, looks like they're using port 22 instead. Uh, with NetConf, if in case you didn't know, NetConf rides on top of SSH. So you can use the native port of 830 for NetConf communications, or if for one reason or the other, maybe firewall policies, maybe something else, you could just rely on port 22 to handle the NetConf uh, connection as well. Either will work for you, same result. In this case, it looks like we're building a configuration filter. So I think that we're gonna be asking the system, we're gonna say, hey, uh, Junos device, give me the configuration for your interfaces. Give me the configuration for your system services, uh, specifically the SSH config. 
And that's what we're doing here. Uh, and then this commit filter is the RPC call, which is gonna say git commit revision. Okay, it looks like we're doing a few different things here. Yeah, there's several different examples here of, of making different types of network requests. Um, rather than get to this, let's just go ahead and build our own. Now, spoiler alert, when I sent the email this week saying that this is going to be kind of the focus of our session being the Scrapply, one of the things that I had uh, proclaimed was that I had not used the product yet. Well, I honestly couldn't wait for this session to begin, so I kind of created my own. I uh, hope you don't mind. Uh, I just want to get my feet wet with it. So I have a project here in my network automation examples folder uh, under Scrapply, and I've got a few different uh, options here. What we're going to be doing is I'm going to be rebuilding this line by line uh, in, a, in that uh, source code project where we're going to, again, commit to the code exchange uh, of getting SRX security zones from a device. Now, what we would do with the information, what we get past it, in this case, we're just going to write the, the output that came from the device. We're going to write them to individual files. Now, you, in, in real life, you might not do this, right? You might just send the data to a database. You might send it to ServiceNow. You might send it to Slack or Teams or whatever makes sense. Maybe you got some corporate audit tool that you just want to feed it information. But in our case, we're going to cut a lot of that bloat out. We're just going to focus on writing some, uh, some of the output to local files. So that's basically what we're going to do. I'm going to tear this off of here, and I'm going to use it as my cheat sheet as we go through our own examples here. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. First thing that we need to do is we need to open up GitHub and let's create a new project. So I'm going to spell GitHub correctly. Uh, let's try that again. Here we go. And I'm going to come up to this corner. I'm going to just say new repository. In our case, we're just going to call this the SRX Git Security Zones. Uh, yeah, if uh, I try to keep my projects uh, pretty uh, generic as far as creative names go, uh, we'll add a description. We're going to say we're going to use Scrapply, spell it correctly, uh, to retrieve uh, security zones, security zone information from a from a Juniper SRX firewall. And I'm going to go ahead and click on add a readme. And I'm also going to click on add a git ignore. Uh, the readme file is basically kind of like your landing page uh, for the project, but it's also your primary reference point for documentation. Uh, please always have a readme. Please take the extra effort to document your stuff or else nobody's going to ever use it. Uh, in this case, uh, for the git ignore, I'm going to add Python. Now, if you're not familiar with the git ignore, the idea behind it is that there's a bunch of crap files that you typically don't want to upload to a repository. Um, and so based on the programming language that you're going to be working with, GitHub will automatically create a git ignore file in your repository. So those files, if they get created, will be ignored for all git operations in the future. And for license, I think the most agreeable one is still Apache 2. Um, I don't know, but we'll just go ahead and use that one. And we'll say create repository. Now the repository exists in the GitHub lab or this GitHub SaaS solution. We need to pull it down to our local uh, environment. So what I'll do is I'll click on the code and I'm going to be using SSH keys to authenticate. We did a past session on how to set that up. In this case, I'll just go ahead and copy the URL that's provided for me. And let's go ahead and open up Visual Studio Code. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a, we're going to clone this repository so that we can uh, begin working within it. So I've got a dedicated uh, server in my environment where I, I store all my code. Uh, I do that now because Docker got really silly with their licensing and said, Calvin, since you work at Juniper, uh, that company has 10,000 employees. So every employee has to pay $200 per month 
to use Docker. And so I said, well, to heck with that. Uh, so we're going to be using Ubuntu Linux uh, instead. And but uh, your experience should be just fine, uh, whatever you use. So we're going to say uh, development uh, and find my repository, networking, automation examples, Scrapply. There we go. And we're going to say get clone. And I'm going to paste in the URL that came in from GitHub. All right. And it looks like we've cloned this repository into a folder called SRX Git Security Zones. Uh, so we'll say SRX Git Security Zones. And I'm going to open a new folder inside of Visual Studio Code. Uh, and I do that just by saying code dot. And that will open up a, um, a new instance of Visual Studio Code just specifically within that directory. That way, a lot of the Git operations don't get mur uh, muddied up with other projects that you might have been uh, exploring. Uh, so here we see the README. This is uh, was generated by GitHub. This is this file that we see in the background. We see the license. That was the one that we selected, generated by GitHub. And there's this git ignore file. This will this knows that we're looking to build a Python package, uh, so it's going to ignore some of the more common clutter that you would see inside of a Python project. Now, obviously, I, I don't want to type all this stuff out, uh, so it's just nice that GitHub takes care of that for us. All right, let's actually begin our coding process. The very first thing that I do within a new program or within a new project is I want to declare what my packages are going to be. So uh, what are my dependencies to, to actually execute this script? And the tool that I like to use for this, you can use pip, you can use virtual end. In my case, I'm going to be using a, a package called poetry. A poetry is just a, a quick and an interactive way of building these Python dependencies. That way, anyone that pulls down this package from GitHub can use the poetry file to recreate my environment or your environment uh, perfectly pristine, no variations. So we're going to say poetry init. And we're going to be given this interactive walkthrough. And so they're going to suggest that the package is named after the folder that we're working in. I'm going to say that's totally cool. So I'm just going to hit enter. Uh, enter on a couple of these. Again, the description that we gave the GitHub project was to be copied here. Let's see. Uh, use Scrapply to retrieve security zone. OK, we're just going to paste that here. Uh, the author is myself and compatible Python versions. I'm just going to keep it as the default. Uh, and do I want to define my dependencies interactively? This is where I'm going to say yes. And we're going to type in, just type in Scrapply. And what we're going to get back is a list of all the packages or the top 10 packages that Poetry thinks that we're trying to install whenever we did a search based on Scrapply. So in our case, we're going to be working with package item number three here, which is Scrapply NetComp. So I'm going to type in the number three. And if I needed a very, very specific version, this is where I would pass that in, but I'm not going to. So we're just going to uh, work with the latest version. And that's good to go. And I'm not going to add anything else yet. Yeah, we're just going to keep it like that. Uh, and just hit enter a couple of times. We get to review the generated file. We feel comfortable with that. And we'll see in our directory now, there's a new file created called pyproject.toml. And this basically just lists out um, what we had done within the interactive terminal. In this case, we're saying Python version 3.8 or above. And then uh, the package that we're looking for is scrapply.netconf. Now, in order to install or to create this virtual environment now, we're going to say poetry install, and that will reach out to our dependencies here and pull down any of the additional packages that it's requiring. So note that we just typed in scrapply netconf in our dependencies, but when you look at what actually got installed, you see, yes, scrapply netconf, but also there's an underpinning expectation that there's scrapply also installed. So you just because you're doing Scrapply NetConf doesn't mean you don't need the base package for Scrapply. You definitely do. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, LXML, which is a Python package to help you manage or help you work with XML objects in Python, is another dependency. But that's it. That's it. <laughs> in contrast, 
Uh, let's let's just give you an example here. Bar temp. If I said um, uh, make directory test, and let's change to that. We did a poetry init inside of here, and just kind of hit enter a few times. And I said yes. Uh, install Ansible and hit the zero. And we'll just yes, yes, yes through that. Here's what gets installed whenever you install Ansible. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's going to be pretty big. Um, uh, spoiler alert. Now, uh, as, as many dependencies as Ansible actually brings into the project, what's actually remarkable is all the things that it doesn't. So a lot of uh, very, very common Python packages to handle certain operations. Uh, Ansible actually just says, no, we're going to bring our own to the table. Uh, so although the list is going to get quite large, it's actually kind of remarkable about how thin they're, they're able to keep the project. And that's going to take a while. So we're just going to keep rolling with the punches here. Um, so again, anyway, uh, Scrapply, extremely lightweight and uh, doesn't take a whole lot to get up and, and running with. So let's go ahead and create our first uh, script. I'm just going to call this app.py. And let's revisit some of the documentation here to see you know, kind of what they're doing and whether or not um, it makes sense for us. Now, you'll see on my screen, I do get an alert from Visual Studio Code saying, hey, uh, there's, no, there's no Python interpreter selected right now. Uh, and the reason that this alert is really important is that Visual Studio Code wants to give you wants to give you some helping hands whenever you're doing something incorrectly. Uh, and because of that, uh, like if you're if you're importing a package but you're calling it the wrong name, or you're importing a package and you're not using it somewhere, um, these types of operations are handled by Visual Studio Code, and it needs to actually see the, the Python uh, version that you're, the actual iteration of your Python that you're gonna be using for your script. Now, in our case, we are using Poetry, so we are using a virtual environment for Python, uh, but we just need to tell it where that version or where that uh, Python interpreter is. So I'm, on the bottom of my screen, I'm gonna select Python interpreter, and it looks like it discovered it because I see it kind of listed right here. SRX gets security zones. Um, it says it's the recommended one. So we're going to roll with that. Now um, we can safely dismiss this alert and move on with our life. Uh, and let's see, exit. And oh, there we go. All right. So regarding our, the first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to import we're gonna say from Scrapply NetConf, and you can see Visual Studio Code is trying to give us a little bit of helping hand. This is why it's a great tool to have. Uh, so I'm just gonna say Scrapply NetConf, and I'm gonna import the NetConf driver. Uh, there's a couple of options here. One being the, the, the NetConf driver, which is gonna work for us in a synchronous fashion. Uh, and then there's the asynchronous NetConf driver, which we'll be looking at a little bit later. Uh, and so from there, it looks good to go. Let's go ahead and create an object. Uh, this object will define the device that we need to, uh, to reach out to and build the communication. So let me pause for just a second. All right, now I'm gonna create a new object. We're gonna call this Junos underscore device. And we're going to open and close brackets here. This to tell Python that the, the data type that we're creating is a dictionary, right? That's what the curly braces are indicating for us. All right. And I'm going to tab over here. Uh, the, uh, the, I can safely tab in Visual Studio Code because it's, um, it will convert my tabs into spaces. <laughs> so don't panic if I say I'm going to use tabs. One of the things that I also like to have a little bit control over inside of my script is you'll notice that when I when I did the tab, it actually put me at the two uh, spaces, like right? so so one two from the left hand column. Uh, the best practices, according to like PEP eight, some of the Python standards, is that you actually use four spaces. 
So in this case, I'm going to move my cursor down to the bottom. I'm going to tell Visual Studio Code, hey, um, instead of two spaces, let's go ahead and uh, detect the indentation from content. This is going to tell Python or the Visual Studio Code, hey, why don't you see how many spaces I'm using and then change based on that. When I click that, it's going to change to four spaces because this one was uh, the only object we had that was indented and it was already indented at four spaces. Uh, so the first object we need to create inside of this Junos device object is the actual, uh, uh, the host uh, parameters, right? So we're going to pass in 192, 168, 135. And let's check in on our, our Eve lab, our Eve and G lab to see uh, kind of what my, what my topology looks like here. I believe I've got two firewalls that are connected through an MPLS backbone. And uh, only the two firewalls are online right now. So we've got Galveston hanging out over here. Let's just click on that and get its IP address. So we're gonna say uh, rollback and commit and commit, all right. And we're gonna say show compare, or show interfaces, terse, rep, inet. And we're gonna look at the management interface, which is 137, all right. And so we're gonna come back over here and we're gonna say this is 137. Now, I should have a username on here that's going to have uh, Scrapply credentials. Let's see, uh, user Scrapply, yeah, okay. So I have a user on my box named Scrapply. It's a super user and it's using a password of 123 or Juniper123. So let's go ahead and add that to our object here. We're going to say the auth, oops, auth username. And we're going to set that to Scrapply. And we're going to say auth password is the super secure password of Juniper123. Uh, we also want to declare what port uh, we're going to be working with. So in this case, I'm going to rely on port 830. And we're also going to disable the SSH host key check. Uh, so we're going to say auth strict and we're going to set that to false and anything else uh looks like transport let's look at the docs let's go back over here to our docs it looks like they're using transport system some timeouts which is very helpful i'll go ahead and copy those and just paste in here all right so there's our connection parameters that defines the device that we're going to be interacting with. So good start. Uh, let's also create an object called RPC. And we're going to say, what is the remote procedure call that we want to execute against our Juniper device? So let's return to our browser and check this out. We're going to say, uh, hold the enter button. We're going to say, show security zones display XML RPC. Uh, so the show security zones is going to get us information like what's the security zone, uh, what, their, what are the interfaces uh, that are associated with that security zone, all that good information. We want to take this information and we want to write it to a file that can be viewed uh, later on. That's the objective for this specific project here. Uh, so that's the right command. It's got the right data. So what we need to do is we need to just copy here this remote procedural call that was uh, determined uh, by issuing the display XML RPC command. I don't think my, my paste game is on point. Let's see. Yeah, that worked. All right. All right. So any questions so far about like what, how this is, um, being set up like if you if you need a little bit of explanation on defining some device parameters if one of these doesn't make sense to you if the import statement doesn't make sense or if this remote procedural call doesn't make sense please uh, feel free to either unmute or just kind of sound off and uh, we'll hopefully get those answered all right, uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna now write the function. We've imported the NetConf driver. We've created 
a device, we've created a remote procedural call, but we need to tie all these things together. And that's what we're gonna do here in our function. Now in Python, and or in my case, I'm gonna create a function called main. It doesn't have to be called main, it could be called uh, Raekwon the chef, it does not matter uh, as long as you align with the appropriate naming conventions in Python. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna just call one called main. We will, we will call this main function at the very bottom of our script when we instantiate it. And we're gonna say, we're gonna create a new option, our new object called con. This is gonna hold our connection parameters, right? We're tying all these things together. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna reference the uh, NetConf driver that we imported. You'll note that when I added this down here, the, uh, the color, of NetComp driver at the top had changed from like a discolored gray into like just a, a full white. This again is Visual Studio Code, just trying to be trying to be a good bro and help out, right? So if I remove it, you can see that the color is a little faded. If I add it back, it'll say, oh, okay, yeah, you finally have referenced the package that you've imported. Uh, so we're gonna import or we're gonna we're gonna call the NetConf driver package, and I'm gonna pass in this uh, to our, uh, our Junos device into it. Now, here's something that I didn't understand when I was getting started with Python, and it might look a little weird to you. I'm using these double stars. And I didn't make this up. I, didn't, I, I got this example from the, the, the project repo that we were looking at earlier. Um, but if you don't understand this, don't sweat it too much. Basically what we're saying here, these two uh, asterisks or these two stars before the name of our object is telling Python we are passing in what's called quarks. It's a, it sounds like a Star Trek character on DS9. It's not quark, it's quarks. Uh, and quarks is basically keyword arguments, right? So basically what we're saying, we're passing in this Junus object and all of these things are key word arguments that we're passing into the into the driver. Uh, again, if it doesn't make sense, don't sweat it too much. Uh, there's plenty of references. There's some really great documentation out there to help you hopefully kind of put that together, what keyword arguments actually means in Python. Uh, but for us, now we've defined the connection parameters, let's actually open up that connection. So we'll say con dot open and we need to call the i'm sorry we need to call the open method so we're going to use open and close parentheses at this point we should have an open ssh connection to the firewall uh, and over port 830 basting on uh, brian brian got the wu-tang reference yeah Wu -Tang forever absolutely um, and so now we've got this object called connection uh, and it is an active uh, uh, NetConf session to the device. Now, if you've ever debugged NetConf before, if you've ever opened a NetConf session to a device, you would know that it works in the traditional client server model, right? Where the network device is the server and your SSH client, whether it's PuTTY or it's a Linux terminal or if it's a Windows terminal, whatever it is, that's the client. Now that's an important point to remember because when you build the connection to the device, the, the client, meaning your script, meaning your putty, meaning your whatever, is going to receive a list of capabilities, NetConf capabilities from the device itself, right? So you open the session, uh, you authenticate, it's happy. The device is gonna immediately say, hey, here's the cool things that I can do with NetConf, just so that you are aware. Um, and that's an important part because what we can do now is I can actually print to the screen, I can say uh, connection dot, uh, what is it? Server, server capabilities, right? And this is so great. Visual Studio Code here is giving me all the um, cheat codes that I needed uh, here. Let's see if we get a good, uh, no, not a really good description here, but nonetheless, it's very helpful. Um, so with that being said, let's actually, um, let's stop right there. Uh, let's, let's execute this. First of all, we want, again, we're good network engineers. When we open an SSH connection to a device, we want to gracefully shut it down as well. 
So looking through some of my options for the connection object, I should have one over here called close. There we go. Looks like that's the, the one that we're looking for. Open and close brackets, and we should be good to go. Uh, let's also print another message to the screen uh, just to help us kind of visualize where we are within the process. They were going to print this message and we're going to say we have an active SSH connection to our firewall at this point, right? And I'm going to put another line right up here and says um, we have declared our connection object but do not have an active SSH session yet, right? Just to, again, to help us understand when we execute this code, where we, where we are within the script itself. Now I need, to, we've defined the function, which has like, you know, the build connection issue this, uh, uh, receive the capabilities for netconf and then print them out to the screen and then close the connection we still need to call this function, right? And the way that we are gonna do this in Python is really weird. And I don't know if I will ever get comfortable understanding why we do it this way, but it's, it's, it's how we do things. So we're gonna run this if statement and we're gonna say if name double underscore prepending double uh, underscore uh, at the end. And we're gonna say if this is equal to underscore underscore main underscore underscore let's close that off uh, and then we want to say if that's true then execute our function called main now as i recall the reason that we do this really weird thing like this uh, and by the way this you don't have to do this but this is the best practice for um whenever you're executing Python scripts is you have this type of clause at the bottom of your script. The reason that I remember this has to do with the difference between like an executable script and then uh, the difference between that and like a Python module or a Python package. The, I don't remember all the details. Uh, there's there's tons of, just Google it, you'll say. Um, uh, there's some really good documentation. There's some really good explanations. I always forget. I just don't, I, I've gotten to a point where I no longer care about expert knowledge on every single nook and cranny because this will, software development will never be my primary skill. So I just kind of accept that this is the weird thing that Python's looking for. So we'll just run with the punches here. All right, so we have our script defined. Let's open up our terminal inside of Visual Studio Code and let's clear the screen. And I wanna make sure that I'm still in that Python virtual environment. So the way that I do that is I'm gonna say, which Python, and it's gonna come back and it's gonna say, uh, right now, if you were to execute Python, this is the path of the binary that would be executed on your system. And so I just happen to say, okay, that's great. And if I did a pip freeze to check out which Python packages are installed to this specific Python instance, we should see LXML, Scraply, and Scraply Netcom. Okay, so we're inside of our working Python virtual environment. I should not get any kind of import package issues at all. Let's go ahead and execute this now. We're gonna say Python app.py, all right. We see that we get a message that says we have declared our connection object, but do not have an active SSH session yet. Uh, and we actually got a failure here. The failure said the password prompt seen more than one assuming authentication failed. That's interesting. So let's validate that our password is entered correct. Ah, that's the wrong username. It's not scrappy, it's scrap Lee. All right, so uh, listen, <laughs> Don't get discouraged when you have errors in your scripts, right? Uh, this is going to be an extremely common um, situation for you. You're gonna have, your script is gonna fail 80% of the time and it's gonna work 20%. And in that 20%, you're gonna ask yourself, why is it working right now? <laughs> this is normal, don't panic, uh, but just, just try to keep your composure and kind of like understand the error messages that are coming back. Sometimes they're really good. In this case, we got a, a pretty good 
uh, message saying that the problem was a scrappily authentication fail. That's a good message. If I, I mean, just, just the type of message, the actual text behind that is like, hey, uh, Scrappily saw the password prompt a couple of times. We're assuming that there was an authentication problem. That's a great error message, right? You compare this with some of the other tools out there like Ansible. And my friend, it can get pretty difficult. Like the Ansible will sometimes like present you with like just a wall of red text. And it's up for you to look through that red text and figure out what went wrong. And surprise, most of the time, it's not in that red wall of text. So it's a little frustrating. Ansible debugging has never been uh, revered. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but now, let's see, we got some um, uh, story of my life. Brian, uh, Brian, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you, you'll fail a lot. It's OK. Uh, Paul says, Scrappily unsupported platform system transport is not supported on Windows devices. Um, so, Paul, uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, use Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL, um, I would highly, highly, highly encourage that uh, because it's, it's literally a Linux um, uh, instance on your Windows machine. Um, if you can get away with that. Yeah, spin up a CentOS. Yeah, uh, there's there's always something. Sometimes, I mean, listen, I, I love Microsoft Windows. I think it's a great product. It's so much better than it used to be. It really is fantastic with WSTEL2. It's actually my preferred development environment these days. Um, if you can use WSL2 on Windows, highly recommend doing it. It's super lightweight. It's super fast. It's really well worked into the operating system. And it's honestly just the... The best way to write automation on a windows box um yeah so okay uh, again good error messages right kept our composure we looked at it we said ah okay we think we understand what's going on let's clear our screen and execute our script again uh okay so we got a little bit further down the road and so we're feeling a little bit better about ourselves uh let's check out what we got here got some more error messages uh again we are getting the print object saying we've declared a connection to the object, but we do not have an active SSH session here. That's right here. Now we start seeing tracebacks whenever we actually do the open. So let's kind of figure out like what's actually holding this up. It looks like there's an end of file expect exception style platform. Uh, let's see if we got anything else here. Uh, encountered end of file reading from transport typically means the device closed the connection. Okay, that's uh, pretty. Oh, laptop is locked down, crazy tight, which is good and bad. Yeah, yeah, I I feel the pain. I know what that's like. Um, uh, corporate IT, God bless their hearts. Right? They're trying to protect us, but. Holy moly, they can turn a great operating system to a <laughs> just a non-ending stop of frustration. Uh, so in this case, it looks like we're, we're unable to successfully build a connection here. Um, this is telling us that there's an end of file reading from transport. Um, so let's do this. Let's try to flip the transport here. Uh, just so you know, uh, transport itself, and this goes back to the error message that Paul was saying, uh, transport system. This it, let let's revisit the docs because I, I don't want to I don't want to feed you lies here. But let's actually come back over to the docs and talk about this because I thought I thought this was pretty neat. Uh, let's see if we can find maybe under basic usage here, and if we look at the is there is transport listed? It might not be. Uh, am I in the NetConf one? I might be in the wrong one, but uh, from what I understand, transport equals system is a way of saying use the host operating systems SSH uh, program, right? Rather than uh, something else. Uh, so it allows you to just leverage whatever is on the device itself. Let me see if I can get this spoken to a little bit better basic usage and looking at the, these are the drivers. So again, the drivers are what we interact with within our script. You can see those that are listed here and what to call them. You can also see their asynchronous partner 
uh, as well. Uh, let's see. Get driver or actually transport. Uh, there's a transport driver. Uh, Scrapply, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, Scrapply supports using open SSH configuration files in a few ways. For system style, um, uh, SSH transport, which is the default, passing a path to the config file will make it, uh, Scrapply will point at your SSH config file, thereby executing your actual systems version of it, which is uh, super duper helpful. Uh, looks like there's some others, but I think in our case, the error message that I was getting was based on the SSH transport. Let me try to change the port here, because I think it might, might get something different if we use port 22 instead. Okay, yeah, that worked. All right, uh, so interesting. I, I need to figure out what it is on the NetConf side that using the system requires you to use port 22. So I've, I've done this in other examples where I've used port 830, but I may have been using a different transport. So it, and it, it worked just fine. But in our case, we had to flip the port down to 22. Uh, that referenced the systems SSH transport. And now we can see we have an active SSH connection to our firewall. Now, you remember we, we stopped here. We didn't do anything automation-y, if you will. But what we did do is we told Python to print out the capabilities that came back from the server. Remember, we build a connection over NetConf. There's a you know, TCP, CENAC, ACK type of uh, behavior. And then the server, meaning the network device, sends to the client and says, hey, now that we're friends, you should know what types of things that you can do as far as NetConf is related. And that's what we're printing out to the screen right here. And that's what we see on the screen right here. Uh, so interesting to know, we, in the Junos world, we use NetConf uh, 1.0. There is a NetConf 1.1, uh, and it does not, it, it's based on Yang. It's now, it's no longer based on XML schema definitions or XSD. It's based on Yang. If you've talked with me in the past, you know that I'm not a fan of Yang. Uh, might not be the biggest fan of working with XML, but I'm... I prefer it over working with Yang. I just don't like having to worry about Yang data models. It's it's a big, it's a big pain. Uh, so since we're using 1.0, we know that this is going to be formatted in the XML uh, schema definition XSD, which is already taken care of for you by the Juno. So you don't need to worry about any of that type of of stuff. All right, so it looks like we have the connection. Uh, it was pretty fast. Uh, I wonder if we can put some, some timestamps to actually figure out how long this is taking to execute. So let's do Python uh, timestamp script. And we'll see if anyone has asked the question of how to do this on Stack Overflow. Uh, let's copy and paste, because there we go. Python code. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it looks like someone here has got some, eh, that's, that's importing quite a bit. I think there's a better way of doing this. Let's see. I just wanna do a speed test or is my browser dying on me? There we go. Let's see current date and time in here. Uh, let's, oh, this is a good resource, w3resource.com. Well, it looks different. I am, hmm, maybe this is the wrong resource, but that's effectively what I'm looking for right here. We're gonna import a package into our module called date time. And I don't, I think that's a default in Python. I don't think we need to do a poetry install. Let's validate that first. Let's open up our Python interpreter or Python REPL just by typing in Python. And I'm gonna say import date time. Now, if this package does require to be downloaded from somewhere, I'll get an error here in Python. But it's a it's bundled within the default, uh, so I don't I don't need to worry about adding this to my poetry file, my list of dependencies. It looks like we'll be good with this. So let's uh, do some good old copy paste from the internet because that's how we roll. And let's go ahead and just copy it all and paste it at the top. 
Uh, typically, you want all of your import statements to be at the very top. Um, that's just uh, kind of what we see here. So it looks like we're importing date time into our script. Uh, we're going to do a snapshot. We're going to say uh, start time is going to be equal to this. So that will go ahead and give us a snapshot. Uh, where was the call this? Boom, boom, boom. All right. And we're going to uh, paste this at the bottom as well. All right, so we'll paste this right inside of our connection here. And instead of start time, we're going to call this finish time. And this will help us uh, finish time. That'll help us kind of understand you know, when it started, when it stopped. You could also subtract them from each other and find out like how many milliseconds it took, but uh, we're, we're okay. Let's go ahead and hit uh, the button again. So now we get a timestamp and we get another timestamp at the bottom. So it looks like it took about two seconds uh, for our script to execute against the device. Again, we didn't get anything from the device other than its capabilities, but all in all, two, two seconds is acceptable. I will, I will not complain if my script takes two seconds to complete. Uh, so great, got some timestamps. Let's uh, kind of bump this one down to the bottom of our script so we have some some clean separation as we're building this out. All right, now we wanted to get this information, the information regarding our security zones. We wanted to get this from the, from the device, but we haven't called our RPC yet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna reference our open connection object, which is connection. Actually, let's create a new object first. We want to store the result of something. So we'll say, our object name is result, and we'll set it equal to the connection object, but we're going to run the remote procedural call method. Now, uh, the way that you do this is kind of interesting. You can see the Visual Studio Code is trying to help me by uh, giving me some auto completion. And uh, it, Visual Studio Code knows this by looking into the actual methods that we're calling and saying, all right, here's what you're trying to do. Look at the description. It says, uh, typically used with Juniper device or if you want to build and send your own payload in a more manual fashion. Uh, you can provide a string that will be loaded as an LXML element, or you can provide an LXML object yourself. Uh, so pretty cool. It looks like we need to do, we need to call this filter underscore and then set equal and then the name of our RPC, which in our case, we just called it RPC up here. Now, if I remember correctly, this underscore is to prevent a naming uh, clash uh, with a, another function inside of Python. So, it's, you know, like just thinking like a human, you would probably just say uh, the filter for our remote procedural call will equal RPC, but filter is already reserved. So it's inside with Scrapply, it's just filter underscore. All right, so here we're making the RPC call, the remote procedural call based on what we declared up here, uh, which is what we got from the device. Now we want to actually print the results to the screen. So we're gonna say print result dot result. The reason why it's result dot result and not just result is that this object right here, this isn't like a, uh, a native string or a native um, uh, dictionary or something like that. It's an actual uh, Scrapply object that comes back. So we need to look inside of that Scrapply object. In this case, I happen to know that uh, the output comes in as result. So let's just change this up just really quick, just to prevent some kind of confusion. Uh, we can call the, the output received from the device anything. In fact, we'll just call this, we'll call it anything, right? Just to prove the point. Uh, and so now what we're looking for is we want to print to the screen the anything object, but only the value that lives at the result level within that object. I hope that makes sense. Now let's go ahead and execute this again. And what we should get is a little bit different. Yeah, cool. All right. So uh, just talking start and stop times, it looks like 21, 12, 47 was when we executed this or when it finished. 
and it started at 21 12 46 so about one second to complete again not too bad won't ever complain about that uh, but the difference here now is you see that we get the uh, the output from the API and here it goes and it's, and it's giving us the security zone information it says here's all your security zones here's all the information uh, regarding these uh, interfaces that are associated to the security zone uh, so this is the information that we want now, I don't want this as an XML object when I write it to, uh, to a file, but we'll worry about that later. For now, we're in a pretty good position. We have something that's actually working. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and commit our changes back up to our GitHub repository. So uh, I can do this one or two ways. In Visual Studio Code, there's this uh, source control uh, tab down here that will actually help you uh, manage all of your git commit, git pull, git push operations. That's the super easy way of doing things, and I highly recommend to always use those. But since this is kind of like revisiting what it's like to, to work within a GitHub project, let's just do it from the command line as well, just so that you see it one time. So uh, if I type in from the command line, let's first let's clear the screen a little bit. And let me actually maximize this. So we're, we're all laser focused on the important part. If I type in git status, what's gonna come back is my command line or git is gonna tell me, hey, listen, um, you're up to date with the code inside of the repository, but you've got some files that haven't been included into GitHub's perspective, right? Your source code repository's perspective. Um, so, just because we're in the working directory doesn't mean all the files automatically get checked in to github we don't want that right so that's kind of the function of the git ignore but it also forces us to to manually add files so that the git protocol will actually consider them for checking in and checking out think of this as dropbox right let's say you got a folder and dropbox it owns that folder well, maybe not the best way, but like you could tell Dropbox, hey, add this one or don't add this one, prevent this one from being synced, those types of things. That's effectively what's happening here. So I can either do this manually by saying git add app.py, right? And if I hit git status again, it'll now say um, git or app.py is no longer in the untracked files. Uh, but it, it does have changes that need to be committed. So you could literally just type in each file, like git add this, git add that, or you could do a couple shortcuts, which I always encourage. Uh, you could do dash A, capital A, will do all the files, uh, or you could do uh, even a shorter cut of git add period, and that will add the entire local directory uh, into there. Now you'll note back on Visual Studio Code, these now have been added into the staged changes. There's a little A right there to indicate that we're adding some new files. If we look back at get status, you can see those that were previously untracked in red are now in the green, but they're, they're, we, we still couldn't add this to GitHub just yet. Let me show you how I know that. If I say git push, so it's gonna say everything's up to date, but I know that's not the case because we actually haven't committed these three files. So we actually have to do a commit operation in Git. It's not enough to just add it to the inclusion. You actually have to commit your changes just like you would on a Juniper config. So we'll say Git commit and we need, you need, it's mandatory, you need to pass in a message. Now this is to help future you and to help other teammates understand what the heck you're doing with this committed change that you're doing. In this case, we'll pass a message and we'll say, um, adding a working proof of concept. Concept, All right, and we'll do that. And then now we can finally do the git push, which uh, will add our files back up into the GitHub repository. If I, if I refresh the page right now, it's still gonna have those three basic ones. We haven't pushed it yet. So let's go ahead and do git push, and it'll tell you that, hey, we, we're good to go, right? If I refresh my page now, I can, oops, wrong page to refresh. If I refresh this page, I can now see the, the three files that we just created. You can see the commit message right here in the description. You can see how long ago this was actually created. In our case, it was 28 seconds ago. All right, starting to feel pretty confident. 
Now, if you remember from a couple of months ago when we did a, uh, a workshop on like your first Python package, when we were talking about GitHub and kind of best practices, one of the things that we tried to declare was that um, just like you should never work like in a virtual, um, uh, you should always do your Python code in a virtual environment. There's also some best practices when working in a project in GitHub, especially when you work with teams and especially when you're, you're, you're touching a project that actually is like production level automation. And that is you never want to check in into the, the main branch, right? You, you never want your code to go directly to there. You want to be working inside of a, a branch concept, which is basically like a, a safe space snapshot of, of the code and it allows you to commit changes, make changes, make reviews, audit it, you know, delete things, add things. And only when it's been reviewed do we do a merge request to merge the code into the main branch, right? So let's go ahead and follow our own best practices advice and let's create a new branch in GitHub. What I'll do is I'll click on this one branch over here and say uh, that was the wrong thing to do. Let me uh, drop down from the menu and uh, find or create a branch. Let's go ahead and create a branch called uh, development. Development, I promise English is my default language. Uh, and we are gonna click on this create branch development from main. Now what this is gonna do is it does exactly what the message had said. It's gonna create a new branch based on where the main branch was at that specific time. Now I can make, I can safely make a bunch of changes into the development branch without it affecting the production environment. And then we'll of course go through like the merge request and stuff when we're, when we're ready for that. Now, what I need to do back on my system is I need to tell uh, uh, my uh, Visual Studio code, my, my project, hey, I actually want to use a different branch uh, and the branch lives up in GitHub. And I believe I can get away with just doing a git pull operation. I might have to do a git fetch, but let's try git pull. And it says already up to date. I'm going to move down to the branch part of my Python here and say, ah, there it is. All right. So origin meaning like it's it's up in the the origin the source code uh repository in this case uh, github and it says there's a um a branch here called development so what we'll do is so my project knows that there is another branch up in the into the the cloud or uh, the sas or the uh, github it knows that it's there but it's not currently working inside of there. So what we'll do is we'll say git checkout and we'll say uh, origin uh, development. I think that will do it for us. Uh, you are in the detached. Oh, no, no, this was the wrong way of doing it. I, I hate this part, hold on. Uh, git checkout main. Yeah, okay, so we're back there. Get checkout uh, development. Let's try that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've checked out the development branch now. So don't don't do it in this fashion. Uh, that that does some silly stuff. I'm not a Git expert. You'll get lost. You'll screw it up. It's okay. Um, I, I highly encourage you to uh, to play around, get better with it, get more proficient than I am with it. I, I know the basic things and that's all I need to succeed in my role. Uh, but maybe for your environment, you need to actually be an expert in it. I uh, highly encourage you to get proficient. From now on for the rest of the webinar though, I'll be using this uh, source, co source control page within GitLab, GitHub because I don't want to deal with Git much more. All right. Oh, uh, so we feel like we're in a good spot, right? We we have like a working proof of concept where we're using Scrapply to issue the NetConf RPC and we're getting the data back. It's structured as L, uh, XML. We'll need to convert that to a Python dictionary. Uh, but for now, let's see if we can do an example using asynchronous instead of just synchronous. So we'll go ahead and create a new file here. And I'll create this file and we'll call it um, 
app dot or app underscore async dot pi. So we're going to be using the async IO package within Python to handle asynchronous communications to multiple devices at the same time, which will mean that our asynchronous our functions need to be rewritten in an asynchronous fashion. Now, if you've never seen async IO before, this will look pretty alien and that's okay. Um, I'm personally not a proficient expert in async IO either. Um, all the async operations I've done in the past are in JavaScript and they're oh, quite a bit different, uh, but let's just kind of work through this together. So uh, what we need to understand is that there was that netconf driver that was the first thing that we imported uh, inside of our script last time. That's not going to work for us now, right? As the documentation had stated way back, uh, scrappily, uh, scrappily async, where are you? My, or netconf, my friend. Here's the docs. What we need to do instead is we need to import the async version of the netconf driver. Let's look in here. Okay, so here's an example of doing just that. This is the one that we used in our synchronous one. And here's the one that we're gonna use for our asynchronous one. So the naming nomenclature is very similar, right? Uh, I'm assuming a lot of the transport stuff is, is also very similar. Uh, okay, good to go. Uh, so we're importing the async netconf driver into our script here. Uh, let's also import some of the important things needed for this to actually take place. One of them is async IO. Uh, we need to import async IO in order to handle the asynchronous connections. Uh, there is a dependency on from this library on this one being installed. You'll note that uh, I don't think that we installed that inside of our poetry environment. So we'll show you how to return to the poetry environment and add packages later on. Another thing that I want to import is something to help us work with the L the XML object that we got back, right? I don't I don't want to see the XML. I want to I want to work with it as a Python object. So in order to do that, I'm not going to be using LXML. I'm going to be using a different one. Uh, this is a newer Python package called XML to dict, and XML to dict will help with uh, converting XML to a dictionary. Uh, and so hopefully that makes sense. This is going to allow, this is me, this is me uh, building a lot of shortcuts based on other stuff people have done. Uh, but I've, I've found really, really great uh, success using XML to dict. Now, what's interesting is that Visual Studio Code is saying, hey, my friend, uh, you're trying to import XML to dict, but it's not within your Python environment. So if you if you run this, it's going to fail. So again, we'll have to revisit our poetry to make sure that we get XML to dict installed. Um, other things that I want to import, there's a, a logging mechanism inside of Scrapply that will help us uh, detail exactly what's happening at each step of the way. And I really appreciate having uh, that type of functionality. So we're going to look inside of the logging collection and I'm going to import a, uh, a, a method here called enable basic logging. And this will allow us to have a file that's written to the system uh, detailing with like timestamps, like uh, verbose, like what is happening at each step of the way. So if we run into problems again, we're not kind of uh, left to our own devices. We'll actually have something to kind of fall back on and, and run with. All right, that should be good for now. Let's go ahead and create uh, the, the logging aspect of it. So we're gonna call in the package that we just, or the method that we just imported, enable basic logging. And if I open and close parentheses, Visual Studio Code is gonna say, hey, look, you're trying to use enable basic logging. Cool, here's some of the things that enable basic logging is expecting you to pass. And the first thing is the file. So we wanna just go ahead and say, yeah, we want to create a file and we'll say file equals true. And the level of our debugging, we want to uh, set that to debug. All right, uh, debug logging, um, all the documentation uh, as to the options that are available here 
are available within the Scraply uh, documentation itself. So if you'd like to tweak this, maybe change this to warning, change it to info, but you don't know how to do it, you don't know what you don't know what it's looking for. Again, just reference the docs and hopefully you can figure it out. Uh, let's create our two devices. So we had a device called uh, Galveston and we have another device called San Antonio. All right. Uh, can you base? Can you guess where I'm based out of? Uh, and those are our two firewalls that are in our Eve and G environment. Uh, so that's come on, buddy. That's this thingamabopper, and that's this thingamabopper. Uh, we'll need to get this IP address here pretty soon. Pretty soon, but let's reference the object that we had created earlier and just do a copy paste job on it. Uh, we'll just do that and paste it here for Galveston. And we'll do the same thing for San Antonio, uh, but we need to change the IP address. And I think I also wanna change some of the parameters uh, to, to help with uh, the async operations. I don't think we can rely on system anymore. Uh, show, show interfaces, terse uh, FXP0. And we can see the IP address for the management interface is 146. So let's go ahead and update this thingamabopper right here. Now we've got two devices that are defined here. I'm gonna remove the port, because uh, that should default back to the uh, port 830 for us. I'm gonna remove these timeouts as well. And the transport, according to the documentation, again, always refer to the docs, uh, right here, if you are using async, you must set the transport to async SSH. This is the only async transport supported at this time. All right, that's easy enough. Let's go ahead and update the transport to async SSH. And we'll just copy and paste these goodies down into these goodies. So now we have two definitions, two devices, Galveston and San Antonio. Uh, let's combine them into a single object. So let's create a list and we'll just call that list uh, inventory. And I'll set it equal to, uh, to contain Galveston and San Antonio. And what we'll do is we'll loop over this list later on when we get to the async side of things. And uh, we'll, uh, that's, that's the object we'll pass in. There's an object here called inventory. Uh, before we get to the crazy stuff, let me drink some water getting parched out here. If anyone's got a uh, big Texas energy, yeah, that's right, my friend, um, which is an ironic statement because we have so many energy problems here. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, okay, good to go. Um, I'm gonna use the same RPC uh, that we used before. By the way, hi, Andre, how are you doing, sir? Good to see you. Uh, there it is, the, the remote procedural call. Remember, we got this from the devices itself. We, we typed in the show command and we said, hey, display the XML RPC. Tell me what the API call is effectively. And then we just copied and pasted the output into our script here. So get zones information is gonna get us the goodies. Uh, now uh, there's some things that I, I'm trying to reference my cheat sheet over here. Uh, okay. Now what we need to do is actually define the asynchronous functions. Now you'll remember uh, when, when we created the connection or the, the function in uh, the synchronous fashion, it was define and then the name of our, uh, the name of our function, when in this case was main. Now I point that out because it's gonna look a little bit different now that we're working with async IO and that we have to declare that the package or the, the function is asynchronous. So it's gonna look like async and then the name of the, or the word def to define our function name. And we're gonna call this uh, gather security zones. Now this is gonna be the function that actually builds the connection to the devices that runs the remote procedural call, the API call and gets the data back, right? Uh, and then there's gonna be uh, another main function that's also gonna be asynchronous that will call this one. So let's just handle the connection side first since we, we kind of did this on our other one. Uh, the difference now, again, it starts with async. Uh, oh, we also need to pass in 
um, a device right here, right? Uh, so we'll 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 have a temporary placeholder for whatever whatever object we're passing into this function. For here, we'll call it device. It can be it can be ice cream. It can be anything. Um, I'll just call it device because that's effectively what I know it to be. Uh, within here, uh, within the asynchronous function, uh, you'll see a lot of similarities, right? We want to create an object called connection. We want to use the async network uh, or netconf driver uh, instead of the standard netconf driver. And we're going to pass in the, the keyword arguments again, right? So the quarks, if you will. Uh, and that's going to be equal to the object that we're importing. So you haven't seen the, the, this in its entirety just yet, but remember, we have two devices in an object or in a list called inventory. We're going to loop over each one of these devices, and each time we loop over it, the, the object that we're working with at that time is going to be called device, and that's what we're going to be passing into this function. And so here's where we declare the actual connection. Now, we haven't actually built the connection. We're just declaring all the parameters, the driver that we're going to use, et cetera. What we need to do now is we need to open the connection to the device. And this is kind of where things will get a little bit weird for you uh, if you've never seen async before. So let me just change the spaces again to four spaces. There we go. We need to do something uh, very similar like we had last time, right? It was connection open, where we call the open method, where we build the connection. But this time, we need to tell Python to await for this to execute and get a result back, right? Remember, the idea behind async IO is that it's, it's non-blocking. So things are going to execute. Uh, as soon as uh, they get ran through. So in this time, we're saying we'll, we'll hold up async IO. Uh, we want you to actually wait for the connection to come back uh, before proceeding. So this is kind of like a, like a timeout, <laughs> stop right there um, type of uh, situation right within the function. Again, if you don't work with async IO very often, uh, some of this might not even be relevant for you. But if you're wondering how to get like maximum performance out of your scripts, this is really the, the way to go about doing things. All right, uh, so now we're gonna uh, create another option, kind of like what we did here, where we created an object, called, we called it anything, right? It used to be called result, uh, but we basically said, here's the connection object, run the RPC against the device and store the output in something, in this case, we called it anything. In our case, we'll actually call it result. We'll try to be a good scout and be friendly to anyone reviewing our code. And we're gonna say the result is equal to, again, very similar to the last time, we're gonna say connection, and we're gonna say RPC, filter, and again, the underscore there to create the, to prevent a namespace clash. And then we're gonna pass in our, the, our RPC. Now the difference here, again, we need to tell async IO, we need to say, whoa, Kimosabe, like hold on just for a second. Don't go ahead and proceed to the next step until this step gets completed. And if you watch what we did up here, the way that we tell async IO is to, to kind of hold its horses is to actually use an await clause, right? Again, this comes with time and practice and exercise. If it doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, uh, hopefully experience can help uh, help you get off the ground and running with this. Now, uh, once that comes back, we want to do a connection and we want to close that connection. And as you might expect, we want to tell uh, async IO to hold up, wait for that to complete before proceeding to the next line. So wait for the connection to close. And then we want to return the output to the main function, which we haven't declared yet, but we want to return the output of this call back into the main function. So we're going to say return result. Okay. So uh, what we've done is uh, in the in the past script in the synchronous one, we had the main function, which was like uh, handling the connection, RPC calls, printing to screens, and blah blah blah. And this time, we actually split the connection element and the RPC call outside of our main function. Now this is uh, good development practices, right? You try to you try to take what I, what I like to do is I like to think of like all the verbs, like what are the actionable things that are taking place? 
and I try to put them in their own individual function that keeps the script modular, that makes it a little bit easier to maintain. It makes it a lot easier to read. So in this case, we've done that. We've taken out the connection, we've taken out the command, uh, and, and we've broken that up into its own individual function. Now what we need to do is we need to reference this function that we just created into our main function, right? So let's go ahead and create the main function, which will be definition main, just like it was last time, except this will also be an asynchronous uh, function. Again, we need this function to be asynchronous because this is where we're gonna loop over the list of our devices. So we need this to be also be asynchronous. All right. So I'm gonna copy a little bit of the code that I saw on the repository, because again, I'm not an async IO expert and I probably won't be anytime soon, but there was a pretty good example as to how to handle what they call coroutines. Coroutines, let's see if I can uh, speak my native language properly. Advanced usage, let's look for the example that I was going off of. I might not have it here. Let's go back to the bottom. Async, here's an async example using Cisco iOS XR. Uh, there was an example here. Okay, so here they're actually making configuration changes. Now, um, not, not, to, not to make this a vendor thing, right? But you should just know, like especially if you're, if you're in a multi-vendor environment, Cisco's NetConf implementation still to this day is limited to doing configuration changes, right? You cannot issue RPCs. You cannot get structured data back from the device. Uh, so if you're going to use NetConf for Cisco devices, just remember, you can only do config things. And so that's what we're seeing here. They're, they're locking the candidate configuration. They're making some changes. These are not the droids that I was looking for. So I'm just gonna type up uh, the example that I wrote uh, last night instead. And that's gonna say coroutines, which is an interesting word that's, um, yeah, uh, that's an interesting word. Uh, we're gonna say, let's say gather security zones. So we're gonna call in our function, our asynchronous function right up here. And I wanna pass in uh, the device, right? Now, device, as you can see, it's saying, hey, uh, device is not defined. And so what I'm actually gonna do on the same line is I'm gonna create a for loop where we loop over our inventory. Uh, so for device in inventory, right? Uh, so kind of interesting. Uh, what are we talking about here? The first thing I want you to know is we're, we're looping over the devices inside of our inventory list, Galveston and San Antonio. Each one of these has all the connection parameters associated with it. So I'm telling Python, hey, loop over that list. And for each device inside of that list, run it through this function called gather security zones and pass in the device that you're currently looking at, right? And that's what's actually gonna execute um, down through the async function that we created above. Uh, and so this is, yeah, there's, there's a couple of different ways that you probably could have written this, but this is the example that I was given uh, and I know that it works. So we're gonna roll with this one. It's kind of weird though, if you've never seen this, like in, in Python, there's, there's this like terminology that we, we use called Pythonic. Uh, and it's basically like doing things that follow kind of the best practices in Python or the Zen of Python. Um, this is one of those things that you could make the case for uh, in that you're simplifying, you're removing the amount of code by kind of collapsing some Python functions or some Python operations on the same line. Um, if this is confusing for you and you don't feel comfortable with it, uh, you could have done something like this instead. You could have broken this out. You could say for device in inventory, right? A traditional for loop. Uh, and then you could have said, um, gather security zones device, right? The thing is though, that we need, we need this output stored in an object. We need something to collect all the device output that's gonna be returned from our function. So in this case, it makes, it's a little bit easier for us to actually do that in the fashion that it's written here. Uh, but just know there's, there's a couple of different ways that we could have accomplished this. All right, so we're gonna say, in this case, uh, results, 
results is equal to, again, uh, another await function. And we're going to say async io dot gather. And then we're going to reference this coroutines object right up here. So until we execute right here, again, uh, passing keyword arguments, but it's, it's in a list format. I think, I think this is the way to do it. Again, this asterisk thing, I will admit, it's a little complicated if you've never seen it before, but highly recommend you checking into keyword arguments and arguments. In this case, uh, the, the actual function isn't summoned until we issue this uh, await async gather and we pass in what it is we're hoping to gather from here. Uh, at this point, we now have and we should have a result or we should have multiple results from our devices. So let's figure this out if that actually took place. So we're gonna loop over this. So we're gonna say for each result in results, right? Again, results is a list because there are multiple outputs uh, coming from multiple devices. And now we need to loop over that object right here. So we're gonna say for each result in results, and we're gonna say print, each result uh is it oh actually yeah let's do this because it, it'll be interesting uh to actually see what the output looks like and then uh again we need to just copy actually we need to do a little bit different on the if statement at the bottom so if name is equal to underscore main like that right like the traditional way of kicking off a python uh function inside of your script uh, what we need to do now is we need to tell it async IO, and then we're going to say get event loop. And we're going to say oops, get event loop and run until complete. And the function we want it to run until it's complete is the main function. Now, if that looks scary and intimidating, I kind of feel your pain. Like I, when I first looked at async IO, I was like, what the heck is going on here? Basically, what we're saying is when this script gets executed, this uh, if condition is going to be evaluated and it will always uh, equal to true in our cases. So you don't need to really understand the under underscore name, the under underscore main. It's just a weird thing that we have to deal with. Uh, maybe in Python 4 that will go away. I don't know. Um, but what we're doing is we're summoning the async IO library and we're saying, hey, I want to create a uh, an event loop. I want to get the output from this event loop, and I want that loop to to run until it's complete. Now I don't know what some of the alternatives are here. Let's say um, let's let's delete this to see whether or not Visual Studio Code uh, run and execute run forever uh, call close. Looks like there's a whole bunch of things that can be done inside of an event loop. But the only thing that I've seen thus far is um, uh, this run until complete and then we pass in the name of our function don't sweat it too much if that part doesn't make sense uh because it, it's kind of fuzzy for me as well uh python app underscore async this is going to fail uh for a couple of reasons but we'll go through each one of them so let's hit enter the first thing it tells us python says hey there's a module error Right, we tried to import a module called XML to dict, and it's not inside of your Python environment. Uh, and you can see that Visual Studio Code is sitting here staring at us, saying, "Like, yeah, I was trying to tell you what's going on." All right, so now we just have to install XML to dict into our uh, environment. So we know that we're working inside of a, of a poetry environment because that's our order of operations that we set things up. I need to update the poetry dependency files to include XML to dict. So the way that I do that is I type in poetry add and then the name of the of the package. In this case, I'll just copy and paste, and that will go ahead and add. Uh, it'll update the the um, the dependencies and it'll and it'll also install it into our environment. So if we come back over to here, um, now that our project is being managed by Git. Any changes that take place to any of the files will now be um, given this kind of indicator to say like what's changed since the last time this file was added into GitHub. All right, so it looks like it added XML to dict, which is great because now anyone that pulls on this project will, will get all of the dependencies. Uh, so we feel pretty good. 
Let's run this again. I still think this is going to fail. Actually, this won't, this squiggly line won't go away until I change my Python virtual environment and then change it back. The, the reason I'm guessing is that Visual Studio Code only looks at the packages you have installed when you summon the virtual um, environment. So now we can see that XML to dict has, uh, the squiggly line has gone away because it's now in our virtual environment. Uh, let's go ahead and issue this again. I think it's still gonna fail. Let's see why I think it's gonna fail this time. Now this, I think this is going to work, but we're not going to get the output we're looking for. Let's show you why. Okay. Oh yeah, there was one more that didn't get imported in here. And uh, so we got the same error type, a module import error, but it says there's no module named async SSH. Now you'll note that we didn't add async IO to our package dependencies because it's part of the Python package itself. Right, so anytime you install Python, surprise, you got async IO ready for you. The problem though, is that our use of async IO in this case requires an SSH driver called uh, async SSH or an SSH package. So let's go ahead and add that just like we did with XML to dict. I'm gonna say poetry add async SSH. And it looks like SSH, <laughs> async SSH has its own list of dependencies because now they're being added as well. One of them is cryptography, which is typically associated with SSH packages. All right, now when we execute this, I think it will succeed, but the output won't be what we're looking for. So let's hit enter. All right, so what we get back is we didn't get the, the response, like the actual text response. We are just getting the object itself. So we got an object called uh, a netconf response object and the success is equal to true. Uh, let's also look into our log here because this is, again, Scrapply is just doing some, some great heavy lifting for us. In case you are interested uh, or uh, you ran into any kind of problems, you can always reference the Scrapply log because this is this is that functionality we did right up here, right? When we imported the basic logging, this is a result of it, which is awesome because it, especially in an async fashion, because we can see things are happening to different devices at the same exact time. Uh, so we know that the async stuff is happening because different connections are taking place to different hosts right at the same time. So really, really cool, um, but you can also, uh, look at each line and figure out like what's taking place at what given time. So what was the RPC call? What was the data that came back? All those goodies, right? Um, now, I want to do another Python thing that is a very common operation. So we know that we got this result back, right? And we printed it to screen and it's this netconf response object. Well, guess what? I don't know what that actually looks like. I don't know how to find the thing I'm looking for within this object. Uh, so the way that I like to do this is I will say uh, print and I will say directory or dir, I'm saying that. Uh, uh, so I want to print out the directory of each result, which will basically tell me um, like what are all the things that you can do within uh, this object that came back to you. So let's run that script again. The output's gonna look a lot different. Uh, this is actually the output from two devices, so don't get too shook. This is one device, this is the other. Uh, this is, yeah, all this is the other. Now, some of these are built-in Python things, so you don't need to really worry about anything that begins with like an underscore. Those are just kind of thingamaboppers. I just want you to pay attention to the other stuff that's not within uh, not underscored. So these are all the objects that are stored within the netconf response object. Uh, and one of them, it looks like there's like some error message, elapsed time, that's kind of cool. Uh, if there was a failure, uh, finish time, there's some Cisco stuff in here for, for parsing Cisco commands. You got to use uh, uh, some kind of parser. In this case, they're using Genie. Um, there's some other stuff. So there's an object called host. That would be interesting. Uh, raise for status, raw result and result and some other parsing jargon. And then there's some XML stuff. 
So let's see if we can't print the result object to the screen because I think that is the actual um, string value of what we're trying to do here. So we're gonna say print each result and I'm gonna, I'm gonna specify which object in each result I want. In this case, it's going to be dot result. So let's run that back and see what we get here. I will uh, clear the screen and execute this again. Ah, look at that. Okay, so now we're cooking with grease, my friends, because um, we it looks like we got the XML result that we were looking for uh, for both of our devices here, which is awesome. Uh, so I feel good. I, I'm going to remove the dir uh, print statement because I don't really, I think this is, these are the droids that we're looking for here. Uh, let's go ahead and remove this. All right, so now we're issuing these remote procedural calls against multiple devices at the same time uh, in an async non-blocking fashion. Uh, let's actually figure out how to write this to a file. Now, again, you, you might take this output and you might uh, punt it to a REST API, you might post it to a database, you might do all kinds of things. In my case, Let's just write it to a file so that we can review it, maybe check it into GitHub and that sort of thing in the future. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to parse, uh, and parse is kind of a strong word, uh, this XML object, I want to convert it into a Python dictionary. And if you'll remember at the beginning of our script up here, we imported a library to do just that XML to dict. So now let's leverage that XML to dict to actually convert the XML object into a Python dictionary so that we can you know, specify exactly what it is that we're actually trying to work with here. Uh, so for us, let's go ahead and say um, reply as dict, right? So we're saying take the reply message that came back and then convert it into an XML or convert it into a Python dictionary. So we're creating a new object to store this output. And now we're gonna call on the XML to dict uh, uh, package. And we're gonna, specific, we're gonna specify that we want to parse uh, some kind of uh, string that comes back. In this case, it was each result dot result, right? That's gonna be stored as a, as a Python dictionary now, uh, at, renamed as uh, reply as dict. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and print this out to screen just to make sure that this is working properly. And let's go ahead, clear our output and execute this again. Okay, so what do we get here? So we still have that string. We're still printing the string to the screen, uh, but we also have something else at the bottom here. Now this is an X, this is not a, a true Python vanilla dictionary in that sense, but it, it behaves and looks and smells and behaves just like one. Uh, this case, they're calling it an ordered dictionary just because they're trying to maintain the order within the dictionary because typically dictionaries are kind of, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, but this case, we're, we have an ordered one, just kind of like merging the best worlds of a list where things are ordered and a dictionary where things are uh, stored as key value pairs. Now, we're looking specifically for the name of our security zone. So let's kind of look at this output here. And I can see within the RPC reply under zone and inf zones information, there is an, a list of uh, zones here called zone security. This is what we want to nail down. So let's do this. Let's get back to our script and tell it specifically we're only interested in and uh, objects that live at that level of our dictionary. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of keep this open at the bottom here and say, I want to look at this. Uh, RPC reply kind of started the kickoff. Maybe it's a little bit difficult uh, looking at it from the dictionary. Let's look back at the uh, XML just because it's uh, white space indented for us. So the very first thing at the root of our object is RPC reply. The next thing is zones information. All right, let's copy that and let's paste that right here as well. 
zones information. And now I want to grab all the objects that live at the zone security level. So let's go ahead and add that as well. Now, when I run this, let's go ahead and comment this out so that we won't see it in the output. What we should get back now is just the name of our security zones. Let's run this again. Uh, what did we do wrong? Let's check it out. Uh, print reply to dict. Actually, no, 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 no. We, we, we got exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, it's just the dictionary comes back and it looks a little uh, silly. Uh, so at the top here, we see the first object is zone security name, zone name and DMC lab. We should see another one here called home, uh, another one here called WAN. Uh, so great. It looks like we're grabbing uh, the security zones. Like you don't see any security policies in here. Uh, you don't see any NAT uh, or IPS. You only see the, uh, the security zone uh, basic information. So we're starting off pretty strong. Now let's write all this these goodies to file. Now, if you opened up a text file and you saw this, you'd probably close that text file and walk away. <laughs> Have somebody else go do it for you. And I don't blame you. It's kind of ugly, right? So rather than just writing this as it is to a file, Let's actually make it a little prettier. And the way that I'm gonna be doing this is I'm gonna import another package into our environment, a package that specifically focuses on templating things for you in Python. And this is used extensively inside of Ansible and the project is called Jinja2. So I'm gonna import from Jinja2 and I'm gonna say import environment and import file system loader. And we haven't talked about any of these things, so we'll, we'll take that time to do it right now. But the first thing that we need to do, and you're probably yelling at me, is to add Jinja2 to our list of dependencies. So the way that we're doing that, we're gonna say poetry add Jinja2, and that will update the, uh, the appropriate files and also install uh, the dependencies, which in this case, there was only one, which was markup safe. Now, again, what we're trying to accomplish here is we have this Python dictionary with all of our security zone information. What we want to do is write it to a file, but in a way that's a little bit more consumable by human eyeballs rather than just this massive um, unruly uh, looking dictionary. All right, let me swap off of the virtual environment and swap back so that uh, Visual Studio Code understands that we've installed Jinja 2. All right, so the squiggly line has gone away. All right. Okay. So now we got environment and file system loader. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, see you later, Dan. Thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. Uh, and always, these will be up on YouTube in case you wanted to, to wrap out the session. Uh, what are we doing here? Okay, we're, we, we have to template the, the output because it, it looks just ungodly right now. And so Jinja2 provides a couple of things that will help us um, with this. One is we declare the envir environment. That's where we're gonna say things like, hey, look in this folder for templates and hey, um, use these options and stuff like this. That's what the environment uh, comes from. The file system loader, as I remember, just allows us uh, to, to write to the local file system. I'm not an expert on that, <laughs> um, but you know, uh, that's what we need to do. So let's go ahead and set some parameters uh, to, to make this actually work. Uh, up here, before we even get to our dictionary, let's go ahead and say, let's create a new object called env. This will be our environment. And we'll reference this module right here in the environment module. By the way, I'm not just pulling this out of my head. I, I have a cheat sheet. Um, always use the API documentation for the projects that you're importing because they'll, they'll provide the missing pieces in case you're wondering, what do I do now, right? That's the place to go. Uh, so I'm gonna use this environment method that we're importing into our script from the Jinja2 package. And I wanna tell it uh, loader equal to file system loader. And then I want to pass into here the name of my directory that's going to hold my templates. In this case, I'm going to reference a directory called templates. It does not exist yet. We'll get to that point just in a second. Uh, and I also want to add an option to say trim blocks equals true. 
right? So two completely different things that we're setting here. One, we're telling the uh, the Jinja two environment that I want I want the file system to look into a directory called templates and then use that as the the base starting place to find your Jinja two templates. The second option we're passing here is trim blocks equals true. Uh, and if you've worked with Jinja, you'd probably run into this a couple of times. The idea here is that Jinja 2 will automatically create some white space lines, some new lines uh, every, every time it's, it's looping through. So we want to trim any of the white space. We're going to cut out any of the blank space inside of the Jinja 2 template output. That's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, and now we want to tell uh, the, the Python script which Jinja2 template we want to create or which one we want to reference. Uh, we're going to say template is equal to environment get template, and then we're going to pass in a file name called um, uh, uh, securityzone.j2. Uh, and now we need to create this stuff. So let's go ahead and create our folder. We know that our folder needs to be called templates. So we'll say new folder templates, and we'll say security zone equals uh, security zone dot J2, and we'll create a new file, call it security zone J2. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cheat just a little, and I'm just gonna paste in that Jinja2 file I've already created for this effort. And, oh, no, not, we'll just type it out. It's, it's three lines, it's pretty simple. Uh, inside of Jinja2, we need to say for zone, in security zones, security zones. So we're creating a for loop inside of Jinja2. If you've never seen Jinja2 before, this is what it looks like. Uh, and then we need to close our, our for loop. So we're gonna say end for, that's gonna end our for loop. Inside of each one of these, we want a line with two spaces and a little hyphen. And we're gonna set this equal to, I'm going to say zone, and then we're going to we're going to find out uh, where uh, the name of our object is. We just want it printed out. We want the security zone name printed to the screen. Uh, let's see if I can. Let's run this one more time because I think I lost the output here. Okay. So the security zone name looks to be right at the root of the object, and it's called security zone, zones security zone or zones security zone name. All right, that's the thing that I'm looking for. So we'll go ahead and ask for that. Again, we're going to loop over the output of all the security zones in in this output, and we're going to say for each one of those security zones look for an object called zones security zone name and write that to or that should be um, uh, written to the to the output here so that's the jinja2 template kind of looks weird again only experience is going to help you get um, familiar with that now we need to just write this output to the file and we will be complete here with our task for the day all right uh, so rather than printing this to the screen, I'm actually going to save this output as a new object. We're going to call this, what do we call this up here? Security underscore zones. So I'm going to say, let's go ahead and create that object. Security zones is equal to the, uh, to the, uh, the value the, from the XML parser. We were previously printing this to screen. Now we're storing it as an object. Now we need to run this object through the Jinja2 template that we have here to actually create the file. A lot of things going on here. Hopefully you're able to kind of keep up with the workflow as to, you know, we, we perform a function, we get the data, we strip out all the crap that we don't want, and then we have this pristine object that we want to run through a template. And then the template's gonna help us create a really pretty file uh, that we'll write to the file system here. Uh, so here we are, we got security zones. It looks like it's pretty happy. Let's actually write this to file. And the way that we do that is we need to uh, first run this through Jinja2. So we're gonna say uh, templated security zones equals, and this is where we reference uh, the, uh, the Jinja2 uh, rendering. Oops, Jin templated security zones equals template, dot render 
And then we need to pass in uh, the name of our object into our Jinja2 template. So we're going to say security zones object will be referenced as security zone objects inside of the Jinja2 template and store that output into a new object here called templated security zone. And then finally, we write this to the disk by using the with statement where we're going to open up a new file. Uh, we're going to say, um, we're going to call this uh, slash output. Let's create a new directory called output. Output will store our uh, template output. So we're going to say with open. And I'm going to say the name of the file should be, oh, let's go ahead and do an F string so that we can reference variables inside of our, our string here. Uh, each dot, uh, each result dot host, which will be the host name, or in this case, the IP address um, from our dictionary all the way up here. Uh, and we want to save that as a YAML file extension. And we want to open this file with the, uh, the permissions of write uh, so that we can actually write instead of just reading the file. Uh, and we'll call this um, temporary file holder. We'll call it uh, file holder. And then here we perform the write option. We're going to say file holder and out uh, templated security zone. All right. So this is kind of weird. Uh, if you've never written a file, if you've never read a file inside of Python, this is traditionally going to be the way that you do it. You have to tell it which file to open. You have to tell it what permissions you're going to open that file as, either with read write permissions or read only permissions. That's where the W get, comes from. You can also use A for append as well. I think that gives you right privileges as well. Um, and then, yeah, you, you pass in uh, the object that you want written to it. Kind of weird, I'll admit. It, it's not very uh, intuitive, especially when you play it back verbally. Uh, but let's see if this will actually work for us. Python app underscore app underscore async. Okay, so we got an error. So this time we got a type error, meaning that the type of object that we're trying to work with uh, was not happy. In this case, it says IO text IO wrapper object is not callable. Don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, maybe uh, well, so there, there was one file created, but nothing was put in it. So that was a, that did not work. Uh, so let's look into here. Oh, that's right. We created an object, but we didn't uh, use the right method. So uh, it's, uh, we need to write the method or we need to use the right method and pass in the object that should do it. Okay, so uh, we didn't get any output because we had removed all the print statements from the screen. But here in the output folder, I now see two files. Let's open up those files. And what do you know? We get the security zones uh, listed as a, like in a YAML format uh, with uh, each one having this little thingamabopper right here, right? All of this came from the Jinja2 template that we ran through, right? So if I change this to an asterisk, right? And we ran this again, those files will no longer have the dash, they have the, uh, the asterisk. So um, anything that we run this through within the template will actually get re uh, uh, reproduced here within the output. So this is actually um, kind of valid YAML. So I feel pretty confident with this. I think we're in a good position now. Uh, Let's see if there's anything else. I think we're good to go. Yeah, I think we're good to go. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll update our code. And as a good developer, you should update and you should update your project in with uh, your, your commits should be kind of grouped to a similar function. What I mean specifically in this case, let's create a get message for all the updated Python dependencies, right? And this was like adding things like async, SSH, pen, then 
Uh, and that doesn't really apply to app sync. So I'm not gonna use that commit message for here. I'm gonna definitely use it for the poetry files. So we'll do that one and we'll do it for this one as well. Uh, and that's really it. That's the only two files where this commit message makes sense. So I'll go ahead and click this uh, commit. Now I'm not pushing the changes because I have additional commits to make, right? So in this case, we're gonna say uh, create sample output, output and we'll add the two sample output files that we've created here. So we'll say this one and this one and click the checky mark, okay? And then we'll create another Git message and say uh, create Jinja2 template and that only applies to this file. So we'll click that one and click the plus or the check mark. And finally, we get to our async app and we're gonna say uh, created async um, application. Uh, we're not adding anything. We actually just created it. So that that should be fine. Now, Visual, Code, Visual Studio Code says, all right, you currently have four commits that need to be pushed up to the repo. When you're ready, go ahead and click this button. So let's do that right now. And we should have committed those four unique uh, changes up into our project. Let's try to open that thing back up over here and return. Okay, and what we get in GitHub is a banner message to say hey development the development branch has some recent pushes less than a minute ago so let's go ahead and compare those branch changes and what we'll see is we'll see the four commits each one of our message and we'll see all the changes so it'll say there's six files that have changed 290 lines have been added and one line was deleted uh, and the add and delete will be in green and red I wonder what was the red one. Let me see, load diff, ah, uh, a hash on something, so not a big deal. Um, okay, good to go. Uh, we feel confident that this is uh, uh, ready. So let's just go ahead and say, yeah, uh, looks good to me and say, create pull request. Now, depending on what product you're working in, in GitHub, we're gonna call it a, uh, a pull request in GitLab and other products, they'll call it a merge request. It's the same thing. Don't get too tripped up on that. Uh, but this was this would be a time where I would have like a peer review, um, right? I could assign somebody within my organization to review this code, and only when they've reviewed it would it actually be committed. So in this case, we'll just pretend I worked alone and click that merge pull request and say commit confirm. And now we're given an option here, which is really interesting. GitHub says, hey, look, you've successfully merged this to the main branch. Would you like us to delete the development branch? And I'll say, sure, yeah, I don't need it anymore. Let's go ahead and delete that development branch. Now, when I come back over to the project, I will see there's only one branch, and we, but we still see all the changes that came in from the merge pull request. Now this, all of the operations that we're doing here, they're, they're recorded, they're documented uh, fully. You can do restoration, you can go back to previous commits. Uh, but this is why like using the commit message is super important. And it's, <laughs> hey, be a friend to yourself. Um, add pretty descriptive uh, commit changes so that you understand when you're reviewing this or your teammates are reviewing this, they understand what you were trying to do with this specific commit. Like in this case, um, updated Python dependencies, I might want to revisit this uh, iteration and know I can see, okay, we added XML to DICT, async SSH and Ginger 2. Good to go, right? So be, be kind to yourself. Don't be like me, right? Here's, here's what I actually do. <laughs> don't, don't be me, right? Don't just do ASDF or blah, blah, update. Try to be kind to yourself. I'm just, uh, I, I'm usually find myself just kind of shortcutting everything. Um, don't be like me. All right, I feel like we're good to go. Uh, let's do one additional, let's do two additional things. Uh, one, let's create a new branch because I want to add some new files. I want to change the way this is structured. I want to add a readme file. Uh, and then we'll, we'll submit our code to the code exchange and, and specifically the submission process of that so that you can see it as well. So that when you're creating your own projects, uh, you're good to go. 
So what I'll do is let's create a new branch here and I'm just gonna call it uh, restructure. Now, this is a personal preference. You don't have to do this, uh, but what I like to do is I like to have all of my code related stuff in dedicated directories. Uh, and this helps me uh, with understanding uh, we, I don't I, I'm not going to pretend to read that message. Um, I, I like to keep all of my project, all my automation stuff in dedicated directories. That way, anytime I, I jump into a project, I know exactly where the Python script files, I know where the Docker files are, I know where all the documents are, blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna do that right here now with this project as well. I'm gonna clear the screen uh, and uh, make sure I'm working from the right branch. So this branch is called restructure. Let me change back over to the main and I can see look, we need to do a pull. We'll pull down those five changes. Uh, I wanna see if I can change to the restructure branch. So we're gonna say, get checkout restructure. All right, and now I can do all kinds of changes. I can blow up everything. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's remove, let's LL, remove uh, any file that begins with a, or ends with a Python, uh, remove the output directory, uh, let's remove the Pi Poetry. Oops, Pi Poetry. Remove. Oh, oh, I think I could probably do it like this instead. Uh, let's just delete all of this stuff, and I'm going to import um, all of the work that I did in a different directory. The reason for that is I spent a ton of time on documentation, and I don't want that to be uh, forgotten about. Uh, so we're going to copy from a different directory, copy recursive SRX get security zones, and I'm going to say asterisk and into the local directory. All right, so the new folder structure will have a readme file, and it will be very detailed. It will have links to all the docs on how this thing works. And then inside of this files directory, we'll have a Docker container here. Uh, we have the documentation. If you're wondering how this uh, works, we, I'm doing a play-by-play -play on each one of these. Again, hours <laughs> spent on this documentation, so uh, it should be good to go. But if you want to revisit this project in, in this live stream and kind of figure out uh, and have some kind of documentation to reference, it's here. Uh, also, some images that will kind of help you with the build process if you're trying to do things from Docker. Uh, let's now, and there's a tasks file for invoke. Now, if you're unfamiliar with invoke, uh, it's basically a, a shortcut method of, of issuing commands. Uh, you don't have to use invoke if you don't want to, uh, but I'm a big fan of it. Uh, we talked about it in a previous session around uh, Python packaging um, a couple of sessions ago. Uh, and I'm going to add one big update message for all these. We're going to say, updated file structure. And we're just gonna commit all these things at once. One big push to the restructure branch. Now when we come back over to GitHub, we'll see restructure has pushes less than a minute ago. Let's review them. And let's look through all this and, all right, what does it say? 28 files changed, 946 additions, almost 400 deletions as well. There's all kinds of things that are taking place here. That's fine. Uh, let's just say, uh, looks great. Uh, we reviewed all 400 changes. Uh, go ahead and click a pull request. And uh, yeah, well, again, we'll merge it into the main branch here and we'll delete our restructure branch, keeping things really nice and precise. Now, when I visit the, uh, the readme or actually the project, I get the readme file. It's structured uh, appropriately. It's nice and concise. Tells you, you know, if you want to do this with Docker, click this link. This points to another documentation file that I wrote to show you how to do things with Docker. If you want to do it with Python, there's one to there. Or if you just want the John Madden play-by-play -play on how uh, this script actually works, here I wrote some documentation going through each one of the steps that we showed today of how to get the the goody output and store it to the screen. All right, the last thing I wanna do is I want to submit this to the code exchange within the Juniper Elevate community. 
I want you guys to be able to, uh, to edit this and work on this, et cetera. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just copy a bunch of stuff that I've got here. The name of my project is SRX Get Security Zones. And we will add that as the project name and a description. I think I have a description right here. Uh, use Scrapply to retrieve security zone information from a Juniper firewall. Let's just paste it right there. Copy and paste game is on point, my friends. Uh, next, I need to add the repository. So let's go ahead and copy this here into there. And what, te what technology domain most closely aligns with this? In our case, this is a security zones or a firewall thing. So we'll go ahead and select security. What is my super secret Juniper elevate command uh, ID? It's cvinsberg at juniper.net. And let's review all of these really important legal things just to CYA. And we'll say yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. 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 And submit. Okay. And so now my submission has been uh, completed and I will now get an email. If my email was open, I'd get an email saying, hey, we're, we're going through the review process. And I believe the process is just you know, validating that there's no, you know, passwords that are stored in here. There's no sensitive information, um, you know, probably some legal things that need to be evaluated as well. But at the end of the day, uh, probably when you return to work next week, um, I'm sorry, June for holiday tomorrow, but not for the rest of y'all, sorry. Um, you, you should hopefully see this repository that we created today added into um, this section here under security automation. Let's see what we've got. Oh, there's one I did on uh, using Nornir for auditing firewalls. Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll see it here uh, next week whenever it goes through the, uh, the blessing. Uh, there's all kinds of goodies in here as well. All right, my friends, we've gone half an hour over. Uh, we did pretty deep on this. Um, let me just ask for uh, my friends that are remaining, any other questions, anything that you like? Uh, oh, look at that Yang, all Yanged up. I love that. That's awesome, man. Uh, uh, any questions, any, any additional information, any, uh, 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 anything that we covered that may have not made sense today that you'd like some additional clarity on? This is a good time to, to take the opportunity to ask. All right. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out, everybody. Uh, again, uh, I'm kind of impressed. Oh, we had we had no <laughs> no formal content uh, really going into this, except for an example that I wrote last night. Uh, so I'm really glad that we were able to, you know, kind of really give the product enough time to shine, and also uh, revisit the the process of creating projects inside of GitHub. I I can't stress just how important that is or how important it's going to be going forward in a network operations role when you're working with automation. You got to have the fundamentals down on working with Git. It's kind of weird. I admit, yeah, it's kind of weird. There, there's some strange things uh, that you got to do. A merge requests, pull requests, branches, um, adding messages to everything. But once you kind of have that basic aspect of it down, you know, again, if you just know how to do the core fundamental things, you're going to be way advanced uh, in comparison to anyone who's not run into it. Um, so you don't, don't become a Git master unless you really, really want to. It's a, it's a technology that surface level is easy to consume, but it's very difficult to master. Um, it goes pretty deep, um, but yeah, it's, it's really fun. Uh, again, these, these sessions are always uploaded to the YouTube channel for posterity purposes. So if you're interested in revisiting this, once the code submission goes through and gets blessed, uh, that will be a good opportunity to maybe revisit the video and uh, kind of go again, play by play on it. But hopefully the documentation is good enough for you all. With that being said, uh, it's the end of business on Thursday. Uh, we are fortunate here at Juniper to have the next day off. So I'm going to sign off. I'll upload the video tonight. Uh, and if you have any suggestions on what you want to see next month or the following one, feel free to just shoot them my way. Um, always, always open to suggestions. 
with that, please enjoy your weekend. Go see the new Dune movie. If you haven't, I highly encourage you to read the book uh, as well. Uh, super important, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, thanks again, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here.